All right, so we've introduced this idea of, uh, of objects, and we have a couple of different objects here. So we have a, uh, a dice object that has a constructor that takes in the number of sides. So we can build multiple dice to roll a value. And then the roll function rolls that number of sides um, using randint. Our player class, we have defined in there several dice, so every player carries with them some dice in case they need to attack somebody out in the wild, right? That's whenever you're walking on the streets in a dangerous place, you might need to attack somebody, you, you pull out your the bag of dice and you start rolling, right? <laughs> that would probably actually dissuade most attackers. <laughs> if you just like you know drop down to the ground, you're sitting on the ground, you're starting to roll dice and some of that, you know, get a little twitch going. <laughs> <laughs> I think most people would probably run off and thinking that robbing you is probably not in the, their best interest at this point. Don't you uh, pull out a deck of tarot cards? <laughs> oh, today's not your day. <laughs> it is not your day. Uh, okay, so we were uh, uh, using our dice object inside of our player object, so we gave our uh, player several different uh, dice to, to work with for different things. Um, we went ahead and randomly rolled their hit points using a, a d20 as part of the construction. So when a, when a player is initialized, when a player is born, they're given a name, they're given their own set of dice. So this is a new d20, a new d8, a new d6. And then they use the d20 to go ahead and provide themselves with a random number of hit points between 1 and 20. Okay, so they could be very, very weak if the uh, moons do not align for them. All right. We've given a player the ability to display themselves, so they give their name and their current hit points. We've given a, a player the ability to inflict damage to another player. Okay, so when this guy, uh, or when self, inflicts damage to player, it's the amount of damage and who he's inflicting it to. And we have that player, he receives damage in that amount. So when a player receives damage, he has the amount of damage he's receiving, and he reduces his hit points by that amount. All right. A player is also able to tell us whether or not they're dead, okay, where they reflect internally upon their current number of hit points and report back whether or not they're still uh, good, okay, whether it's a value uh, greater than um, zero. Okay, so is dead should return true if they're dead, false if they're not. So it'll return true if their hit points are zero or less. Otherwise, it'll return false. All right, we uh, gave ourselves the ability to get some melee damage. We decided that when we're just you know swinging with fists, that's a that's a d8 amount of damage. If we wanted to go a little more complex with this, we could also randomly roll stats. Right, we can have like strength and intellect and stuff like that, and maybe the you know, how hard they hit would be relative to how strong they are. Something like that, right? Okay, I don't know we need to go all that deep here, but uh, we, we could. Right now, we're just saying that everybody swings a D8. All right? Uh, we also have the ability for them to heal themselves, so uh, uh, they can roll a D6 to give them a, uh, a health potion. All right, because we we're giving them a menu now, right? As you're fighting, as we're going back and forth, you get to choose. Are you going to attack the other guy, or are you going to heal yourself? And that's, uh, you know, you, you, you potentially can hit harder than you can heal yourself, and you got to decide whether you'll survive the next attack and, and, and stuff like that. All right. Now, we said that a player knows how to show a menu. This is all inside of the player class. So a player, this guy blocks, he reads something in, from the user, what would you like to do? One to hit, two to heal. All right, so we are showing this menu to that player, even though right now all of our players are sharing the same keyboard. And then we ultimately return this. Now we talked about blocking versus non-blocking stuff uh, last time. So this guy does not continue on until the user has actually entered an answer and hit hit return. Okay, otherwise it blocks. So. You know, this is something that pauses the game, effectively. All right, and then here is our fight function where a player fights another player. And as long as both guys are not dead, we toggle back and forth between the two players. 
Uh, we show the menu for whoever's turn it is. Um, and depending on what the action was, we carry out that action, right? So if it is uh, um, my turn, if it's Self's turn, the guy whose fight got called here, then we're going to print our name, show the menu to them, kind of like saying, Mike, it's your turn to choose. Then, depending on what they choose, because action is what's returned by that, if they put in a one, that means we're gonna do some damage. So we'll roll a D8 amount of damage, and then we'll inflict that damage on our opponent, name player. Otherwise, they must have wanted to heal, so we'll roll a D6 to get how much we're gonna heal for, and then we're going to heal ourselves for that amount, increasing our hit points by that amount. And then we just print out, we're healing. Oh, let us know so we didn't take a swipe that time. And then we increment uh, turn. Um, well, we add one to turn. It happens to be, uh, we just toggle back and forth between plus one and minus one, I believe. Okay, so that tells us whose turn it is. So by incrementing by one, this will be the next guy's turn the next time through here. Because we're going to keep doing this. We're going to keep repeating this stuff as long as uh, both people are alive. Okay, as long as both people are alive, we'll display the current situation, find out whose turn it is. If it's the other guy's turn, we'll print his name. We will, um, this is, it actually will work fine the way we wrote this, but actually it's a little bit uh, incorrect. We're saying show our menu and reading in the answer, but really we probably should have the player, our opponent, show the menu. In this case, they're both sharing this keyboard, so it didn't cause a problem. But in the event that we had a, you know, a multiplayer game over a network or something like that, and, and uh, um, I wouldn't want to have to make his decision for him. Or maybe I would want that, but, but that wouldn't be the, uh, you know, the, the, the best. So we would ask that, that other player, our opponent, to show his menu, which in this case ultimately does the same thing. It shows up on my screen. Then depending on what the result was, we'll roll some damage. That player will inflict damage on me, and then I'll display my status after getting punched. Otherwise, we'll roll a, a, a heal. We'll update the player's hit points. We'll print out that we're healing, and then the player will display themselves, and then we toggle back for the other turn. Notice that this is not inside the F or the else. It is just inside of this else. So no matter what we did, whether we punched or whether we healed, we always toggle back to the other person's turn. Okay? And we keep doing this over and over and over again until we, uh, um, somebody, until somebody dies. Okay. Now, this is just starting a fight. Now, fights need to occur somewhere, right? Okay, so they're probably going to occur inside of maybe a room. Okay, we might have a, a room object, okay, where a room has a description or, or, or something like that, and then maybe a room has a collection of inhabitants. That is a collection of players that live in the room. Make sense? All right, so we need to have a room object now. So we'll come up here and... Uh, Oh, we'll write it here at the bottom, actually. So we're going to say class room. Haha, <laughs> that's <laughs> funny. Um, and then we need our init, so underscore, underscore, init. Oop. And this guy takes in a, um, takes in self. And then maybe we give the uh, room a name and a description, something like that. So name, description, and we'll say self.name is equal to name, self.description is equal to description. All right, and we'll set those, um, those, kind, those, those couple of things. Now, if we think of this room, so we're, we're, again, we're creating objects. We're trying to you know, continue to practice this correlation between real life and programming. So if we look around ourselves, you know, we look around the room here, 
Um, I mean, certainly there's stuff hanging on the wall and stuff like that. We don't want to get too detailed with our rooms right now. But our room apparently, you know, is filled up with a bunch of players, right? There's a whole bunch of us in here. All right, and um, I know we have some other abilities, but when we abstract you down to our player class, you know how to heal or throw punches. That's all you know. <laughs> That's all you know how to do right now. So we're pretty limited. Okay. But now, how did you get to this room? Hey, you, you were added to this room, right? You walked in the door, and that made you become a member of, of the room. Okay. You, weren't, you weren't installed with the room. You weren't born in here with the room, right? So when they first built the university, you didn't come with this room. In fact, later on today, you're going to be in different rooms. In just a little bit, you're going to leave this room. All right, so the room existed, and then you were added to that room. So would it be fair to say that this room has a collection of players? Collection of players that, that reside within the room? Right now, there's a whole bunch of them. At 3 in the morning, there's probably no players in this room. Fair enough. Okay, how would we represent in uh, uh, Python a collection of player objects? What tool do we have for holding collections of things? A list. Yeah, we need a list. All right, so inside here, maybe we have self dot, let's call it the players. And this guy will just start off as an empty list. When a room is first born, it has a name, it has a description, and it has a, I mean, we have a whole bunch of chairs or something in here. We, it has a place to put players, but there aren't any players in there right now. So we just set it to the empty list, right? Now, we want to be able to add a player to a room. You want to be able to walk in the door, right? So, um, um, so we might say def add player and this will take in the player that we're adding and when we add a player to a room we ultimately want to add it to our collection of players which is called the players so self dot the players dot append that's this language right append uh, and we're going to append the player or the player that was passed in Okay, so this player is being added to this room, to self room. So we'll go ahead and say self dot the players append that guy. Make sense? All right. Now, a room probably needs to be able to display itself. Okay, and a room would probably have its name, its description, and then maybe go through its list of players telling each player to display themselves. You know, so, you know, after like a, a battle royale type thing, you might have a whole bunch of like really beat up people in there and they're basically saying, you know, Mike with four hit points and stuff like that, right? Okay, so maybe that's what a, a room looks like right now. So let's add an ability here. We'll say def display. All right, so when a room displays itself, let's go ahead and print out the name. We'll print out the description. And uh, if you... Um, how many of you have heard of um, something called a MUD, M-U-D, multi-user dungeon? Okay, so only one super geek in the room. Um, how many of you have heard of uh, an MMO, like a, a World of Warcraft, EverQuest, the, much more common, right? Okay. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, Adventure Quest, yo. Yo, Adventure Quest, yo. Adventure Quest. Now, the question, I, I, I don't remember because we've only had like one paper in here. Now, do you do the yo thing in your papers? Oh, yeah. Really? That's probably not going to... I wouldn't do that in an English class. You know what I'm saying? Are you a sophomore or a freshman? Freshman. Freshman, yeah. So you probably haven't had that many English classes yet. I've had one, you know what I'm saying? But he was, uh, he, he was I. <laughs> 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 Oh, man. Well, hey, I, this just supports my thing about you being like a television broadcaster or something. I think that you would you would be great one of those angry guys on ESPN arguing over why such and such was a, you know, was a bad call. <laughs> All right. So when a room displays itself, we'll go ahead and we're going to say um, 
uh, print self.name. Then we'll do a print self.description. That's what I called it, right? Oh, I'm misspelling it. There we go. Nailed it. Okay. And then, um, oh, I was mentioning about MUDs. Let's, let's go ahead and... We have this idea of a MUD. Anybody know what MUD stands for? Huh? You just said multi Oh, did I? Did I say yeah. it? Okay. Well, now we're going to find out who's paying attention. <laughs> Multi-user dungeon is what uh, a MUD stands for. Um, this is the predecessor to our modern games like World of Warcraft, or really our, our predecessor to these online, uh, all of our games today. Which most, you know, almost every game now is an online multiplayer type thing, and then you just apply a genre to it, whether it's a, a shooter or a, uh, an RPG or, or whatever, that type of thing, right? Um, so, back in the early days, before we had super powerful computers and uh, um, the, the, the capacity to have uh, any sort of graphics, let alone high resolution <laughs> graphics, uh, our games were text-based. So you would um, enter a multi-user dungeon, you'd log in, you'd join the, join the worlds. Now you're a whole bunch of people logged in to, it, the, this was back in the uh, days of a um, uh, BBS. Anybody know what, a, have you heard of BBSs before? Bull, bull, bulletin board system. Okay. Um, this is before the internet. So when we you, you had a dial-up modem, and so usually some community had like a computer with like a bank of maybe 30 modems, and you would dial into their phone number, and you'd hear the little beeping. Of, ding, 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 ding. <laughs> Have you ever heard a modem before? Yeah, yeah that's like a perfect representation. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah. <laughs> I spent a couple of minutes uh, listening to modems connecting <laughs> over my lifetime. So, uh, so you would dial up, you connect. And now you're in this bulletin board system, which is basically what we had this last time. Yeah, see? Yeah, that, now, I, you guys might not realize this, but that's literally the recording you took of me before class. I told them to play it right <laughs> at this moment. So, um, so we would have a text-based menu system, just like we've written so far today for our, or so far last time for, with our, for our death match, right? And it would say, what do you want to do? Here's your options. You could look up news and do email and stuff like that, or you can go and play the mud. Okay, you go play the, the, the game. So you go and you go and play the game. Now you're, you're, you're basically dumped into the center of town. You're dumped into a room. Okay, and in that room, you would see the name of the room, the description of kind of what's going on there, and then it would usually say, so also here would be kind of the normal thing. And it would list all the other people that were in the room. These might be real players. These might be like uh, NPCs, non-player characters. So, you know, uh, just people that you could also kill because really it was all about killing. You know, this, this class has taken a turn, you know, towards death is, what, <laughs> is really where we're going. So, um, so it was a game, but it was all text-based. Now, to today's gamer, that sounds boring, right? Um, now, what's kind of interesting is uh, um, how many of you uh, read? Well, not know how to read, but enjoy reading books. Okay, uh, how many of you prefer reading books over? Um, uh, I don't know. It might be a weird question. Over like seeing a movie, but but you know, you might like them both, right? Those might be the two different kind of activities, but. For, let's just stick with the you enjoy reading. What 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 is it about enjoying reading? Uh, what do you like about it? There's no sound. There's no fancy high definition, uh, you know, uh, graphics that you can complain about it being pixelated or something like that. Limitation of the idea directly to you. Okay, so your imagination draws a lot of the pictures, right? Okay, um, so. We would say reading is something that's very old, but it's something that people still do today. In fact, we have all sorts of technology that allow people to more conveniently read. How many of you own a Kindle or use the Kindle app or use iBooks or, you know, one of these readers, right? Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, these things exist today because people like reading. So, MUDs are kind of like reading. When you're reading a book, don't you sometimes find yourself kind of getting lost in the book? Like you almost imagine 
the environment that the book's talking about. You kind of feel like you know the characters. Um, but that's all based on your imagination, correct? That's how a mud was. So you're just watching. And it's really funny when you go back and you, you, you kind of watch a video or so, of something or somebody playing a mud. It's just walls of text scrolling by. So when you're fighting something, you would see it. Um, you know, you would see the result of each attack, right? And sometimes they would, you know, the fancy ones used color. Like you would, I think if you got hit, it would be in red. Like the text would be red text. <laughs> that was that was the extent of the graphics that uh, most of them used. But what happened is you got used to where to look on the screen for the different information you needed. So it really did feel very real time to you. Um, it didn't feel like you had to read a wall of text. You zeroed in exactly where the area that was important. Same thing to traverse the world. You would move through town going you know, north, south, east, west, just giving it directions where I'm going to go. Because there was passageways from this room to this room to this room to this room, and that, that's how it was. The world was linked by rooms. Okay, and that's what we're effectively going to build here. Okay? Um, so, you know, but all of our games today are really based on the same technology. We just have slapped graphics on them. They look better. Right? But it's really the same stuff that's, that's happening under the hood. Uh, in fact, you, if you think about it, maybe some of these older games like this maybe could pull off some stuff that you can't do. We're getting close to being able to do most things now anyways. But you know, that maybe several years ago we wouldn't have been able to do graphically because there wasn't a convincing way to uh, depict a, you know, a certain kind of enemy or, or something like that. You know, but with, a, with it all being text-based, you could paint this giant picture all in words of, you know, what's going on, who the enemy you're fighting is, what their weapon might look like, all this stuff, without them actually having to depict it. You can just talk about it. And that you can pull off stuff because you don't have to worry about frame rate <laughs> of, uh, of, of that kind of stuff. So, in any case, that's kind of what we're mimicking here. So, when a room displays itself, it'll print out its name, it'll print out its description, and then, you know, if we're kind of following the history, you know, we usually is something like, also here, something like that. And then we would go through and we would list each of our, uh, the, for right now, our rooms are only going to be inhabited by players. Eventually, we're going to have, you know, monsters or probably ninjas, I don't know what. Um, but something, something, something in there. All right. So, um, so also here, and uh, so we'll go ahead, and um, we need to go through. We have a collection of players in this room, right? Okay. And I want each. I want to print out the name of each of those players. Let's just do that for now. I mean, we can also print out their hit points and stuff like that. I guess we could tell each player to display themselves. If we kind of want to see the current status. That way, we you know. Usually, when you're a bully, you attack the weakest, right? So if there's somebody, you know, in the room who's like almost dead, you know, that might be your, your first target. So uh, um, how do I go through a list of things? Let's, let's just start with that. I, wanna, I want to um, uh, I wanna loop through all of the elements in my the players list. How do I do that? Okay. You want to do a for loop? It's kind of our for each loop. So maybe for player in self dot the players. We've seen that version of that, right? The in thing in a collection. All right. Um, so for player in this collection of players. So each time through, this variable player will be a different player. Now, What's the minimum number of times this for loop will run? Zero times, because we may have nothing in our loop, yo. <laughs> See, he paid attention that time, because you're, you're seeing the little, the, the spite. Yeah. All right, so for player and self.players, uh, self.theplayers, we want each player to go ahead and display themselves. We'll say player.display. So we'll ask that particular player to call their display function. What does a player's display function do? 
<clears throat> it does this. It prints out their name and then prints out their hit points. That's what the display function does. So if we have, you know, if these are all players in our room, I'll ask her to display herself. So on and so forth. So I'll loop through each person in this room asking each player to call their display method, your display method, your display method, your display method, until we've exhausted our list of players that currently live in the room. Make sense? All right. So that's what we'll do for a room when a room displays itself. So now, let's go ahead. We'll stop fighting for a moment. So we have two players in, our, uh, in, in, in existence right now. And then let's also create a room. Now we decided that for our room, we have to pass it the name of the room and the description. All right, so we're gonna say the name of this room is S120. That is, the, that is this room, right? This is the room number, I'm pretty sure, yeah. And then um, uh, what's, uh, what's the description of this guy? Uh, Littman Classroom? Something like that. Good enough. Okay, so that's what our room is. Now, if I run this program right now, what would the output be? What would you say? Oh, well, you had a lot more confidence in your original response. Nothing. Do you believe that? All right, that, that was kind of my point. Yeah, so we have a lot of code, right? And if I ran this program right now, it literally does nothing. All of this stuff is an untapped resource. I've defined a dice object. I've defined a player object. I've defined a room object. I've even gone ahead and I've, you know, instantiated a player, instantiated another player, instantiated a room. I got three different objects that I've actually, I've used those blueprints to create. But I haven't done anything with them. So I have three variables that I've done nothing with. So this program currently has no output. Does that make sense? All right. So let's go ahead and we'll say r1.display. We'll ask the room to display itself. Now, now our program has some output, right? It should display the name of the room, which is S120. It should display the description of the room. And then it should also display, it should say also here and then show us all the players in the room, which currently how many players are in the room? Here's my code right here. How many players are in the room? I hear a two and I hear a zero. Why is she right? I haven't added them to the room yet. Okay. We have uh, people loitering outside of the door, right? They're outside of the room, but we haven't actually put them in the room yet. All right, so let's go ahead and run this and we'll see at least the description. We'll have the name, the description, and then the, the words also here but we'll see that it will run through that loop zero times because we don't have any players inside of the players. So here's S120, there's the classroom, and then here's our also here. Make sense? Now let's go ahead and let's add those couple of players to our, our room. So that was called add player. So we'll say before we display the room, let's go ahead and say r1.add player p1 r1.add player p2 and then we'll tell the room display itself now there's two people in the room all right so there is our s120 litman classroom also here and here's the two people with their hit points next to them that are currently in that uh in that room okay now um typically when we're playing a, uh, a MUD, let's say, um, what you're actually doing is you're, you're in a shared world, but I'd be, in my, I'd be at my computer connected into a server. She would be at her computer connected into a server. So if her and I were both sitting in that same room, we would be able to independently say what we wanted our character to do. Right now, we're not doing any networking stuff. So all of our controls happen from this one keyboard. So we have a little trouble controlling multiple people here. So we are probably going to revert back to one person for the time being. All right, because we're moving away from fighting temporarily. We'll, we'll come back to the death matches. You know, the abilities built in. Um, 
So what we're going to do here is we're going to have, we'll just stick with our single player. We'll run this again. We'll see there's only one person in that. Ooh, what did I do? Oh, <laughs> don't try to add P2 to your room if you don't have a P2. Okay. There we go. So there's our one person. So now that's that's us. That's we're we're in this world now. Now, typically a room, so we look at this room. We have players in the room, and I also see two exits. All right, we'll keep it simple. That's the north exit relative to where I'm at, and that's the east exit. So if I go north, I'm going to go into the room out here which is the the CS hallway or CS corridor, however you want to you know, however you want to call it. If we go out uh, here, we're going to be in the uh, Stunkel hallway or something like that. Um, so uh, we have two different exits from this room. But let's keep this in computer science. So we're going to pretend like that door is not there. And when we exit this room, we're going to be going into that hallway. Well, that's a different room, right? Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to rename, instead of R1, we're going to say S120. We'll say S120 here. We'll say S120 here. So I just changed the variable name for that. Okay, now let's create another room. So let's do uh, CS Hallway. That guy is going to be equal to a room. CS Hallway. Um, a boring hallway, something like that. All right, so that's our CS hallway. Uh, what other rooms do we have there? So we have S, uh, what, 118 down there? So from our hallway, we're going to have a, a room uh, to, the, to the west. So we have a north, then we have a west uh, turn to get into the S118. So we'll do S118. 118. This is going to be another room. Um, let's call this maybe Locklear Classroom. All right. Uh, what room is the lab down there? Who remembers that? I don't remember. I should know. I think it's 114, maybe. Ah, uh, whatever. Uh, so we'll say Mac Lab <laughs> is equal to room Mac Lab. Put a description of the Mac Lab. All right, so we got a couple of rooms now that are in existence. So, what if we think about this in real life? You know, we're we're looking at uh, the department as a, kind of a bunch of Lego pieces, right? A bunch of independent rooms. We have this room. We have the hallway, which we're saying is a room. We're having uh, the other classroom down there is another room. And then we have the lab down there is, a, is another room. Okay, so we have four different rooms that we're using to, to kind of show uh, uh, the, the current state of the department. But now, from our perspective, we're currently in this room, right? Uh, however we got here is a whole other story because if we're assuming that doesn't exist there, we really need to have like a, an entry into the, uh, the the computer science department, which is maybe the this is going to be considered like a cave. So we have a cave, which is a collection of rooms, and inside of this cave is the actual rooms associated with computer science. We'll get to that here in a little bit. Let's just keep it uh, relatively simple right now. So we somehow got in this room. For us right now, uh, we just put him in a room. <laughs> we, we put the person in a room. And we want to go be able to take the door to the north, which is the only door in here, and get into the hallway, which means that we need to be able to add a room to a room. A room is a collection of players. It's also a collection of exits, which lead to other rooms, right? So if we think about this room as an object, we're standing in this room, we look around, we see there's a whole bunch of people, a uh, whole bunch of players in this room, and we also see that there's a door. We can even peek through the door and we see that there's another room. Forget about whether you know what that room is. We just know there's another room. How do we bolt that room onto this room? <clears throat> Does a room know about the rooms that it leads to? 
Well, we've we got to think about this in terms of object-oriented programming. So in real life, we're thinking that uh, rooms don't really have a, a whole lot of intellect, right? There's not a whole lot of thinking going on here. But from an object-oriented programming perspective, we have to consider rooms as being objects that have to know a lot about what's happening inside of them. Ultimately, us as the programmer gets to choose, you know, when a room's going to utilize its abilities, right? You know, or a room doesn't necessarily act uh, um, autonomously. Although, uh, years ago, when I was, uh, uh, I think I was maybe 10 or 11, I wrote a kind of a, a, a a mud, a mini mud like this, and um, uh, I had because as you're as you're in a as you're in a mud, you might uh, you know you might commonly let's say there's a place you always go to a shop to pick up potions or something like that. You might go north, 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 west, northwest, and you're at the shop, and you kind of remember that little pattern. So to get there, you type it in really quick to to get to the the shop. Well, what I thought would be fun is to have um, rooms sometimes be taken over by something else, so like a significantly more dangerous situation. So what I had is sometimes, as you were going, you would sometimes run into the wood chipper room. So there was a wandering room. So the room was almost like a monster, where it, as it came through, as it manipulated through the, 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 the mud, whatever room it moved into, it took the place of that room. So people entering that room would actually enter the, the wood chipper room. But the wood chipper room would cut and damage would happen because you're in a wood chipper. It's bad. Okay? Um, but the thing is the room would be constantly moving. So your exits would be changing as you're, so you, you, know, you get all freaked out because you're taking all this damage. So you're seeing red text on the screen a bunch. And then you know, you're trying to get out of the room and your exits are changing each, uh, each, each heartbeat of the, yeah, so. That might be some evidence of kind of, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you once you were in the room, you traveled with it. So if you, uh, depending on how many hit points you had and how flustered you got, if you could survive for a while, um, you could be anywhere because <laughs> because the room was just moving autonomously throughout the the world. All right, but we won't have a wood chipper room in ours, and so our rooms will be static entities. All right. But what we need to do is we need to teach S120, this guy, we need to let him know that he has an exit to the north. And that exit leads to another room. What room? CS Hallway. Now, similarly, we need to teach CS Hallway that he has an exit to the south that leads to S120. Does that make sense? So we kind of draw our pictures here. This is S120. CS hallway. This is S118. And that's the Mac lab. I have happen to have laid these out the way that they're going to be represented in our in our world, right? All right, so we need this guy to know how to get here. We also need this guy to know how to get here. So from S120's perspective, I have an exit to the north. So when I go north out of this room, I end up in this room. From CS Hallway's perspective, I have an exit to the south that leads to this room. I have an exit to the west that leads to this room. I have an exit to the north that leads to this room. Does that make sense? From S118's perspective, I have an exit to the east that leads to this room. From the Mac Lab's perspective, I have an exit from the south that leads to this room. Does that kind of make sense? Now, we've created these instances here, right? These are four variables that we've created. Each of these guys, has their own unique memory address. They exist once. These are pointers. Okay, these objects are pointers. So if I were to let S120 know that he leads here, and I would let this guy know that he leads here, 
they lead to the same room. Okay, so I can let S120 know that he's going to have a uh, one of his destinations is a pointer to CS Hallway. Similarly, I can let CS Hallway know that one of his destinations is a pointer to S120. We're not having to create that room more than once. We just have pointers to that room, right? This room exists one time in, in real life. That room exists one time in real life. When we're standing in this room, from this room's perspective, and I peek out there, I see that I can go to that actual, it exists one time hallway. And I can get there. Now, if I walk into that hallway and I turn back towards this room, from that hallway's perspective, I can see, oh, I can get to that same room I just came from. Does that make sense? We're not creating the room multiple times. These are pointers to those rooms. So what I need is I need a way to let this guy head there. and let this guy head here as a starting point, right? Now, would it be okay then for every um, room to maybe keep track of its exits or its destinations? Think of them however you want. Um, so let's call it destinations. Now, what is a destination? If I'm in this room and I see that I can go to the north and get to another room. What is a destination? A destination is a pair of values, right? It's a direction and a pointer to the room you're going to. Those are the two pieces of information that make up a destination. Do we have a way of storing name value pairs? What's this? How? How? How do I store name value pairs? Dictionary. Some dictionary. Okay. So destinations can be a dictionary where maybe we store north points to CS hallway in this guy. In this guy, maybe I have south. points to S120, west points to S118, north points to the Mac lab. From this guy's position, I have perspective, I have east points to the CS hallway. From this guy's perspective, I have south points to the CS hallway. Does that make sense? So a room not only has a collection of players, it also has a collection of destinations that are dictionaries. That's the syntax for dictionaries, right? Open, closing, curly braces. It's a dictionary. All right. Now, when I add something to my dictionary, I'm going to give it a position. Is that is that the right syntax for a dictionary? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. So if I come in here and I do uh, def add room, this guy would say self, this would be direction, and this would be the room it leads to. I would say self dot destinations at bucket direction is equal to room. Like that. So then down here, I can say s one twenty dot add room 
to the north, and this should be CS hallway. Okay. That makes sense? So now that S120 knows about that, but now I need to show the exits. So in the display for this guy, I need to show the exits for this room, show the destinations for this room. So for your homework, and I'll give you this as a starting point, teach each room, well, teach a room how to show all of its destinations, and then go ahead and hook up all the rooms here in the department like we've mapped out, just these four rooms. Does that make sense? Now, you don't have to make it so you can travel to them yet. So when all is said and done, what we should be able to see is if you start in any of these rooms, if you tell a room to display itself, you should see the room, and in here we should see an exit is north to CS hallway. From in there we should see south to S120, west to S118, north to Mac Lab. Does that make sense? All right. I will see everybody on Friday.